right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back for game number two in this best of five series. GMU successful at taking game number one in a fantastic fashion at the very, very end. And apparently, after all, that Yorick split push did eventually do a lot of work, having already claimed those inhibitors, allowing one fight, one kill for GMU. Prince, how you feeling about game number two? I'm super excited for game number two between both of these teams. They love to fight, and that is super exciting, especially as a cast. All right, so we got ourselves the Rex side, the Kled band away. He's a new band this time around, I do believe. But again, they're still pinching the top lane, both teams. They say, you know what? We aren't interested in having those uh, top laners. Well, I guess the Rex side is a jungle, but even still, we saw so many top laners. What it was five or six banned between the two teams last game. We'll see if that trend continues. Is Corky going to be banned away by the side of A&M Morgana? Still that target ban. They do not want her in this game. It's your funeral. Again, taking out all of these top tier picks, and again, that York is actually going to be pinched by Texas a and Don't want to deal with it anymore after that game one thrashing that uh, Eon was actually able to do onto Kokosius. Uh, for the side of George Mason, most likely we'll see that again, that Lucian ban being thrown out there. And for Texas A&M, they have a lot of picks that they can throw out here. They can either pick up that Ezreal that was pretty strong for them in game number one. Ended up being the reason they ended up losing, but they are going to pick it up. Again, that S tier AD carry, just a fantastic game for Kashuna to set that final team fight. And it was very solid as the game had gone through. But it looks like they might just be running it back. With the Join me and that be elevated. Firefly throwing, covering the Jarvan pickup. Maybe take doing a takeaway could be flex to either top and jungle, so it does give a lot of uh, ability for George Mason to draft uh, counter picks. Yeah, that is exactly right. When you got the flex opportunity, it's going to be really nice for yourself. Once again, though, Kushana showed a fantastic job last game on the Ezra, was kind of the reason why they may have lost that last team fight. But even still, his early game and mid game fight, especially around that Drake pit that started AM in a trend for potentially winning the game, was off of this Ezreal. So he'll be back on it feeling good. This time, another uh, trade as this Ajwani, this time going to be played by GMU. So maybe Zest says, you know what? I know how to play against my own Jarvan. I'll take this Ajwani this time around. They're just trading picks at this point, trading the Jarvan and Sejuani. Is going to be favorable more for the side of George Mason, as again I mentioned it. It is a flex pickup. Aurelia going to be picked up again for the side of Texas A&M. Was played by Krakosius in game number one, but can be played in the mid lane with a little bit of gank pressure from the Sejuani here. Are we just going to get a run back for the same team cost besides just this jungle trade here? Nico going to be hovered. Could be picked up if they don't end up picking an AD carry here. Is something that can be pinched by the side of Texas A&M, and I kind of would like them to do that as picking both the Ezreal and Lucian, both of the S tier picks, and you can ban out picks like the Sivir we've seen, Caitlyn even, especially in the power plating meta. Bot lane could be the focus for both of these teams in this second round ban phase. Yeah, we've already got that Thresh band way by the side of a uh, yeah, a and I'm just double checking that my brain is in the correct spot yes uh already having that thresh banned away by a and m we'll see if they ban the kaisa there it is oh my gosh it's almost like i saw it coming uh the kaisa banned away by gmu not interested in having it either so with some of these supports being taken off potentially even the brahm sandra a fantastic one in the mid lane she did an incredible job mr back Planda, on that uh, what adc really do you think the a and m is going to pick up versus this ezreal because uh, there's still a lot of options. Um, Tristana is one that comes to mind at the moment. Woo -woo! I think you have the pick backwards people. It's it's going to be for the side of George Mason. They're going to be picking up the AD here. Uh, in terms of what they are going to be end up picking, Sivir is a pick. We have seen just run the Sivir comp, and Jarvan Galley was that uh, combo wombo that I mentioned in game number one. It's so strong. Lots of such engagement. I am just a future teller here. The Sivir going to be covered by Enrique, and 
Running just another Sivir comp, both of these teams would love to team fight, and Sivir is the marquee team fighting AD carry. She can do a lot to engage with that on the hunt spell. And if they can get really clean team fights on the side of George Mason, they can take game number two really easily as well. Yeah, exactly. That Sivir so good in the team fight. They've already got that wombo combo of the Jarvan and the Galio on the side of GMU. They're hovering Grom, which is a fantastic pick against Sivir because that Unbreakable will absorb so many of her boomerangs, make her life a lot more difficult. So I love that counter pick. And now they've got for themselves a potential top lane or mid lane as Irelia can be switched back and forth between those two. We'll see what they decide to lock in. Most likely a mid laner. In terms of just mid laners that we can see, there's a lot of AD focus on the side of the so it could be an AP pick. We are going to be seeing the cannon here. Most likely going to be a top link cannon for Kirkosius. And so this will be a switch up here with Mr. Black Panda actually going to be taking the mid lane Aurelia. This is a lot, again, both of these teams we've seen in game number one love to team fight and they are picking around it. Not too many. They can run the split push, they can run the 1 3 1, but both these teams really want to team fight. Skarner being locked in, so that's going to be a Jarvan top for the side of George Mason and team fighting galore for both of these teams. All right, thank you so much to Dirty Mobs for the raid of 34. Also going to run down very quickly, uh, Manny, thank you for that follow earlier. I think I already mentioned Rylas, appreciate the follow as well, but with that cannon, it is going to be the Irelia in the mid lane, cannon for the top. And we've got ourselves a game underway. Looking at these two teams and their compositions, there are some interesting things to note, such as, as you talked about, the swapping of the Nico, the swapping of the Jarvan and the Sejuani. Jarvan in the top lane, Skarner in the jungle. I mean, honestly, the place that I want to start with, though, is these jungle switching hands. As Sejuani plays a little bit differently than Jarvan, who has to go all in himself to make that play with the Cataclysm, whereas Sejuani can throw out that Glacial Prison from a Soon, distance and can choose whether or not that was the right us. target, whether or not it's the right time to follow up with a boar rush or something else. My soldiers march on! Those jungles, what do you think? In terms of just that mid lane 2v2 with the Skarner coming in and with Z3S is actually taking away that Sejuani pickup, I do want to mention Anime Lover actually didn't take the cleanse in this matchup this time, opting more for the Ignite, maybe thinking that he can get kill pressure on Mr. Black Panda's Aurelia. The problem is that in terms of the 2v2, if Nico ever gets put behind without having that cleanse in this matchup, she can get run down really easily. So I want to see how Anime Lover actually plays around this mid lane. That is very greedy by him. And it could be a focal point for Texas a and I actually want them to make this a focal point. Having Aurelia Sejuani gets a lot of lockdown, a lot of CC, and Nico really can't escape it unless she has the flash up. Uh, in terms of Skarno, however, it is a pick that has been rising in the meta due to the 9.5 buffs with the Crystal Spire's range being increased and it actually covering the Krug camp so he can actually fully clear his jungle. He's very strong in the meta right now. He makes you pay that Skarner tax that we always talk about. That QSS has to be built on pretty much anybody on the side of Texas A&M if they want to deal a lot of damage. Because if they don't have that Skarner tax of the QSS, he's gonna run through them. It's a lot of their damage is gonna be uh, hampered by that Skarner ulti. In terms of the top lane matchup, uh, I'm just gonna run it down through. Uh, they just both want a team fight. And it's gonna be about which one can get the flanks. In terms of early laning, Krakosha is going to have the advantage as he is playing, playing the cannon into the Jarvan range the melee matchup. Just a quick note, it is Krakosius, not Krakosius. I know that I said that wrong as well in game number one. It was pointed out to me during the short break that we had. So it is Krakosius, just as simple as that sounds. But yeah, I love the team fight opportunities, really, from both teams. Again, it's looking like it's going to be a pretty bloody composition, pretty bloody fighting, as we saw in last game, which makes me even more hyped to see what they can do. But Kenan, with that slicing maelstrom, going to be able to wreck people's health bars as well well as can find the right angle to come in. One thing to note though, on the last game, GMU, they ran themselves a three teleport composition on the top, mid, and ADC. This time it's only two, gonna be on a cannon and AD carry, but still that gives them collapse potential opportunities as once again, Sivir and Nico 
this time on Texas A&M are not taking teleports. So they really are going to have to, for the side of A&M, play wisely around those engages. They have Galio to bring more people to the party, but how many times did we see four or five members in the bot lane, even in the pre-10 minute mark? I'm expecting to see some more of that action happening with all of these across the map play potential opportunities. That bot lane fight you mentioned, again, with Kratius having that Kennen TP, Kennen with the TP in this matchup, he's going to be able to do a lot of work in these early game skirmishes slash team fights. We saw that was those AoE ultimates becoming pretty much the key factors to when both of these teams did want to engage. Uh, running through just keystones here, nothing too crazy going on here. Skarner is going to be taking that Predator. It's pretty much the key keystone for Skarner. It gets, allows him to get into a lot of the back lines very quickly uh, and do a lot of damage, especially earlier on without having that uh, Skarner uh, ultimate up. He's able to get onto uh, a lot of people way quicker, and he's going to be able to deal a lot of damage, especially early on in this game. All right, ladies and gentlemen, GMU successfully coming out with the winning game number one, but this is game number two. The tables have been reset. Opportunities for both teams to find a new venture into a win. So if you have a team that you are cheering for, hashtag their name in the chat. Let us know who you are here to support as we're getting into game number two. We may see a brief pause here shortly as we had it with game number one. Looking like we may get a brief one for game number two. It didn't last long for game one, so I'm not expecting too much in game number two. Either way, let's get into it. The other thing I wanted to mention is this mid lane Irelia. Mr. Black Panda found great success on Lissandra last game. Irelia, a little bit of a different champion. Not quite as, uh, what do you say, invincible with the ultimate, <laughs> but can still make those team fight plays happen. Roamed a lot. I want to see Irelia roaming again. Uh, maybe to that top lane punish j4 he is a bit safe with that flag and drag but he's also a fairly squishy champion especially early on do you disagree with me should i really just stick around and try to kill nico because if you shut nico down a hard early game she's going to struggle through most of it i think she can definitely try to go for the roams but in terms of how mr black panda wants to play this lane now in game number one with the lissandra again your job is to push in the lane try to look for roams look for tp flanks look for all of that when he does have the advantage in the 2v2 with the Aurelia and Sejuani against a no cleanse Nico, he can take over this game. This game can be pretty much all on Mr. Black Panda's shoulders if he can get a lead and if Z3SS can actually allow him to get a lead in this matchup. The problem is he is playing the ranged into the melee matchup. He's going to get pushed in a lot. He's going to be down health. He's going to be starting off fights. Uh, at a lower health pool than the Nico, but in terms of all in all inning the Nico, if the Nico doesn't have pop blossom, if she doesn't have help from the Skarner, she can become a really easy target for that Aurelia all in. In terms of just uh, keystones, as we look around the map, uh, Crocious actually did end up taking the Kleptomancy in this lane. Is going to be able to allow him to scale through, uh, like the Ezreal. Uh, we've seen it. Uh, it gives a lot of gold infusion for whatever laner, and when you are playing that ranged into melee matchup, especially against the Jarvan, if you do have good enough wards to where you can play up in the lane, you can get a lot of damage, especially early tower platings for the cannon, and if you can get the two item spike of the proto belt slash Zhonya's proto belt into Morellos to get a lot of that AP damage, cannon kind of plays how old Season 3, Season 4 Rumble used to play, where he wants to get those 15 to 20 minute team fights where he does have the double pen. Indeed. So we'll see if he can find that. It seems like, once again, it's going to be all about those two item spikes, as we do also have that Ezreal as well. Going to note very quickly that right now, as it turns out, and somebody even noted in chat, thank you, Trombone, for just kind of keeping your eye on that. Sejuani ran Electrocute, which is the incorrect rune. So right now they're messaging the admins to see what the rules are on whether or not they need to remake, whether or not they need to just play it out, how all that goes down. So we're still going to be chilling in this pause for a short bit. If it gets to be truly long, then we'll take a musical break and come back once they figure things out. At the moment, though, I think we still got just a, a touch to talk. Well, hold on. Looks like a everyone may be leaving. Yep, so we are going a to be remaking making the game so we'll remake the game and be right back ladies and gentlemen it should be quick picks and bans this time around 
Don't go anywhere. Face the wall in your hallway Mirror girl looking at me Should I go back and stay? Nah, it was hard, it was dumb Got in my car on the run I didn't think, now I'm gone Now I'm wandering And will you stay?
We are back into the picks and bands. Everyone, cross your fingers. Take a take a take a guess here. Let's see. Aww. Let's see. I bet that it's going to be a Kled band on the side of A and M. I'm thinking a Kaisa band on the side of GMU. Uh, I knew the Morgana. Uh, oh oh oh. Um, GMU is gonna first pick Ezreal. Um, man, am I just not the, like the prediction king here? Because I think I'm gonna be right on all of these. <laughs> uh, I think you already, uh, missed the Amumuin Bard band that was oh. thrown out by Joel here. Ah, uh, unfortunately. a &M trolling us. Yeah. They're literally just banning all sorts of champions. I thought that maybe they're gonna go for the solid Bs across the board, but, uh, instead they went with A, B, B. They could've gone A, B, C, D, E, you know, show them off that they get another alphabet. Either way, they're just the trying to The key play is to ban pizza. That, uh, if you can ban pizza through the pan phase, that's that's when you really uh, outplay the enemy team. On on the stream, because we do our free play games on Thursday nights, that's when people do a lot of fun stuff. I've seen pizza, I've seen Yasuo, I've seen, uh, Fine, what was it, I, I Dunno, uh, D-U-N-O, Kinda. Uh, I don't know, I've seen a lot of fun stuff when people are trying to spell that. And then of course, the challenge is when you're in game, which do you ban first, beginning to end or end to beginning? all depends on which side you're on and Let how they're going to show up on the spectating screen. Either way, we're getting through these picks pretty quickly. Is there anything else you want to discuss about these compositions as a whole? In terms of the compositions, again, both of these teams showed their propensity to team fight in game number one. And it's going to be up to, again, both of these junglers to set up that early game to see which team fighting comp can get ahead in the mid game. Uh, Depending on where Z3SS and Firefly decide to uh, show up, especially in the other game, will show which lanes they want to play around. Uh, and you saw in game number one with Firefly getting Eon the lead on that Yorick pickup, he was able to take over and become that massive split push that, that ended up becoming the game one, uh, becoming the game one, the reason they won game number one, getting that pick, uh, the Yorick cage onto the Juno's Ezreal getting that bot lane inhibitor to open up that entire base. So depending on where both of these junglers decide to go in their early, uh, during the early game is going to decide wh where both of these teams want to play around as the mid and late game come through. Absolutely. Now, while we do still have our three minute time to kind of do more talking, which is totally cool with me, let's take a moment instead of talking about this game, because we've analyzed it pretty hard before we're already in game, and discuss instead last game. Things that we like, things that we didn't like, strong suits, weak suits. We're talking about that Yorick split pushing, doing fairly well, even though uh, towards the beginning of his split pushing, he either died or didn't get much for it. Most of the time, when he would shove down a lane, he would get some new objective like a turret or even the inhibitor um, before dying or being able to back. I think he actually lived more than he died. The other thing that I wanted to mention is Zess playing in last game, the Jarvan, was absolutely aggressive and I think that might have been slightly even to a fault 
for a and M. I'd like to see him choose, especially because Sejuani, once she commits, it's a little bit harder to get out. You don't quite have that free flag and drag. I'd like to see him pick and choose his engage options a little bit more carefully. Rather than just engaging every time someone shows up, let's flag and drag it, let's go! Uh, instead, go, okay, I got a really long cooldown ultimate, I've got a very short distance boar rush, let me pick my time to go with teammates to make the plays that I make far more effective and more critical than just running into the enemy team. Z3SS definitely, I agree. Uh, Z3SS on this Sejuani pick definitely needs to be very... Uh, he needs to be, know especially when his uh, top lane Kennen's ultimates are up. When Aurelia mm. can go in and get those marks down so she can dash around the team fight crazy like you see TF Blade do it. If he goes in and plays too aggressively, he's gonna get picked off by that Skarner. That's the problem here. If he is tanky, Sejuani is just inherently a tanky champion. But most likely, you we will not see Sejuani building that QSS. She just doesn't have the like the large economy to build that item. And she kind of doesn't really want to. She needs to get tankier with items like the stone play and war mugs we saw from Firefly in game number one. So if she doesn't have the QSS and she does dash in a little bit too over eager, a little bit too over aggressive, she's going to get picked by the Skarner. And that team on the side of George Mason, they can kill a Sejuani if she's Skarner ulti. There's no doubt. Yeah, especially Sivir with those crit autos are just going to be insane damage, even against someone who's pretty darn tanky. If they're locked up, not a whole lot that you can do. I did want to interrupt. If you had another thought, please continue. <laughs> you just uh, paused for a moment, and I thought that you were done. <laughs> In terms of the team fight execution, though, I do like how both of these teams do pick uh, the team, like how uh, pick their champions. Jarb and Galio, very easy to execute. It is a Comp, I promise you, if you have a duo partner and you're like, we can't seem to win a game in silver, pick Jarvan Gal, you will have a plus 50% win rate. It is a very easy comp to execute. The bar of execution is very low and it does a lot of damage and can set up your team really well, especially with how we saw Anime Lover on the Nico. He got such good flanks in game number one, but he didn't really have a lot of setup. That was kind of just him on the Nico pick by himself. So, if he's able to get those flanks with with the help of Jarvan Galio, he can get a lot of damage down. He can turn this game really easily. And my last point to mention, we didn't really talk about it a lot because of how much team fighting there was going on. Texas A&M, even though they lost game number one, their vision control in game number one was very, very good. They had a lot of pink wards. You saw almost every time they backed, they would always pick up one to two pink wards. And whichever map, side of the map they decided to have uh, priority and pressure around, we saw at least two to three pink wards being dropped down there. And it was really up to George Base to kind of outplay the vision instead of having full knowledge of what they were doing whenever they were engaging fights. Absolutely. That's what allowed them to pick up the Braum, the Holy Slurp, playing the same champion this time as well. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are back into game. Game number two. GMU taking on Texas A&M. If for some reason you have forgotten, we are in game number two. GMU won game one, and we're excited to see what they can bring for game number two. One of the things I wanted to also comment as we were doing some analysis about last game is the Holy Slurp didn't do a whole lot last game. You think about a Braum, you think about his Winter's Bite, you think about those concussive blows, stacks, the stuns can be absolutely crucial when it comes to those team fights and all those sorts of things. And uh, Braum didn't do all that much, so I'd like to see him try to play at least a little bit more forward, especially into a you know a team comp that... If you can find an edge on Galio, he is not, especially early, the most tanky of champions, first of all. He can't provide anything besides a taunt to help out Sivir. He just is himself. He kind of brings some CC, and that's about it. Um, he's got no hold. Hold on. Yeah, we got a little bit of engage from GMU, trying to catch out A&M as they are doing a little bit of an invade. That was a flash from the Skarner. All right, maybe they wanted to get in and try to grab that Spire. They're going to be punished by losing that flash on Skarner to start the game off. 
Garner most likely wanted to grab maybe that ghost portal placement or get a little bit of a deep work just to see where Sejuani would start up. Get punished. Without that flash, probably won't be too big of a deal as Garner is a level 6 champion. He kind of wants to farm out his jungles, get to a level 6 point where he does have that suppression ultimate where he can just pull and yank the enemy team back into his grasp. Uh, as we go into the lifting phase, again, nothing too weird coming out from either of these teams. Just standard laning, but Saber is able to get that early game advantage. And uh, for both sides, they do have lanes that they do win with the range versus melee matchup uh, against each other in the top and middle. But this bot lane is kind of going to try to go even. And you didn't mention it. This Braum didn't really have too much effect in game number one. Wasn't able to get a lot of pressure down, and uh, we really saw Rylas do a lot of work. Oh my god! Oh, oh my god! <laughs> Burst damage out of the Nico drops Irelia down to just a touch of health. Needs to leave. Nico's still playing up there. The camera isn't showing it because it's just some farming going on. Oh, oh wait, she's back. Dead. Panda maybe gone. Just very low hover. It's a ghost that's running by, so Nico not in range for an auto attack. Uh, there it is. Okay, we're not gonna call that an uh, int, but. If you look up the in the dictionary, inting, uh, you might find a video of what happened there. Moving right along, uh, back to the Brahm in the bottom lane. <laughs> I'd like Some, to see yeah. S focus down there. The Sejuani Brahm combo with both of their passes can be incredibly strong, as well as if you burn Sivir's spell shield, she is a very squishy champion with basically no escape. I'm talking for too long. What do you want to say? One of the North American players would definitely call that soft ending. Oh, there's gonna be another team fight now. Oh, nice nah. Brom blocked the knockup from the Galio. Just trying to get a little bit of a righteous punch in there. Find the Ezreal, the Kusha. Let me say this again. Kushuna doing a good job. Here comes the Sejuani. This is what I'm talking about. Looking for the engage onto the Sipper to find the stun. Looking for the secondary stun. That's it. Enrique should be going down. It's not going to be first blood, but the ADCs are traded over as the Skarner has come in as well, getting a little bit of damage down onto Zest. The Sejuani has to walk away. Should be fine, though, to leave the fight. Both ADCs, the target of the enemy team, both go down. In terms of just who, which ADC is going to get the advantage there, Ezreal with the teleport here uh, is going to be able to teleport back in the lane and get all of that entire wave. The problem that I do see for the side of Texas saying that is that mid lane matchup. The fact that Animated Lover on the Nico was able to get the kill so early on and actually pretty much just get it. She got it solo. She had zero help from her jungler. That is a very bad sign for it and Texas a &M. That matchup can turn really hard and... Uh, we see the Aurelia trying to dash around and do all of the fancy stuff that Aurelia does, but again, anytime Anime Lover hits that root onto the Aurelia, he locks him down for so long with so much damage, and that mid lane is a lane that actually should be winning for the side of Texas and m George, uh, Black Panda should be getting advantages in that lane and pushing that lead. Alright, good stuff, good stuff, especially from that Nico in the mid lane, is up a little bit in farm, Irelia, as the game scales later, will be able to wave through like a monster at the moment though, is going to be a bit more of a struggle, in the top lane, you gotta give some credit to J4, I own, doing a fantastic job, kind of harassing Kennen, keeping Kennen underneath the turret, not letting Kennen get out too much far, because the range is the advantage, as Mr. Black Panda gonna lose a lot of health in the mid lane, dash back in, seeing the turret take a shot onto Nico, won't be going down though Nico able to sidestep a lot of that and it's just waiting for the ignite to come up and that might be another kill when it comes up however really it goes ahead and recalls in the mid lane losing out on more farm next beat and here's the problem with having mid lane uh without having any sort of mid lane card and when your mid lane is so far behind Aurelia is continually having to go back and during that time, ZPS has to pick up that wave in the mid lane. And every time he shows, it gives Firefly the ability to farm up. We do see that the Nico has the 10CS lead in the lane, but Skarner is actually leading around uh, two camps at this point onto the Sejuani, and Skarner shouldn't really be sitting even with the Sejuani, especially in the early game. If he can get to that level 6 point where Sejuani really can't... If Sejuani can't really get her early games off when Skarner is at his weakest, and he can get to that level 6 point with being even with having those uh, Predator boots on, he can do a lot of damage in, in this mid lane, per se, with Mr. Black Panda being so far behind. If we ever see Skarner try to uh, turn this matchup even more, uh, we can see that mid lane tower fall really quickly. 
Oh, a little bit of gank potential up here at the top lane as Firefly looking to make the play. Gracious just gonna immediately flash away after getting Cataclysm by the J4. So they burn the flash, but that means that another opportunity arises at later stages once they can maybe see if Skarner can re-gank up there. The Dwani trying to make a play around the mid lane, but it looks like she's just spotted by the bot lane here. A lot of things going down. Could be a bot lane skirmish down here. Oh, so it's a Dwani for rush. Nicely spell shielded by Enrique Ooh. trying to get the blast going. Can't find it. And the dashes are there. Look at that collapse from Texas A&M. Great job there taking up out the Sivir. Tying the game up in kills and pretty much tying it up in gold as well. And picking up this Ocean Dragon is really... Oh, not Ocean. This is Cloud. Okay. <laughs> My point is out the window there. Oh, damn. that's all I right. Play mid. One of those things going you, you kind of set up in your head something that you want to talk about and then you get a little bit of misinformation. In the meantime, though, Anime Lover continues to get harassed away. I really level six, and that's where you kind of start to gotta re respect her a little bit more when she gets those resets. So taking a bit more domination in the mid lane despite still being down about 10 CS. And that is what happens when your balling is able to roam up good play by Kashun and the Holy Slurp. They actually got such a fantastic combo on to Enrique there. Were, was able to combo him down in that bot lane skirmish and them transitioning their power in the lane up to the mid lane, alleviating the pressure that Mr. Blackhander is facing in this Aurelia versus Nico matchup is really going to assist this uh, Aurelia into getting into that mid game point where now she is able to pick up that Merc that is getting tankier and tankier. So, oh, oh they're going to look for comes, a bot lane. Yeah, now. here comes the Skarner. He's got his ultimate. There is Gracious. He's got no flash. He finds the double stun underneath the turret. The Skarner's going to flash in. However, that ultimate will secure the kill onto the cannon. And Ion just in time to take away the turret shot. Make sure that Firefly lives. Uh, really around the corner. Two shot barrage going to be a bit too late. Just sneaks by the J4. Close stuff there from the cannon. He tried hard, but in the end still went down to GMU. It's a gank. I really got to the top lane. Find the ultimate. Ion in trouble. Uses the catacombs. Flashes away, but the dash is there from the Aurelia. You can't get away from Mr. Black Panda. who will take you down. Good roam by Mr. Black Panda there to get the kill onto Ion. Doesn't have to burn anything besides just his ultimate there. Burning Ion's flash and uh, good job by him to get these kills. He needs to be able to get some of these injections of gold to stay even in this match that he's been set pretty far behind. And again, he was pretty far behind in terms of CS and in terms of lane priority, but Anime Lover wasn't able to get too much in that lane, and now Aureli can hit that point where she can go pretty even in this match, and with the help of Sigon, with the state 3 SS coming into mid lane, Aurelia can do more than she has been in this early game. And checking in that CS, Irelia still only down about 10, but look at the bottom lane. It's 20 CS up for the Ezreal, who's doing a fantastic job. Kashuna showed a stellar performance last game, and this time around seems to be doing just as well as Zess has focused a lot of attention in the bottom lane, making two deaths on that Sivir scoreline. So keep their eyes on where that Sejuani goes. Do they continue to shut down this Sivir, or do they try to start making plays somewhere else like this Kennen, the top lane, who's also down about 10 CS? Oh, here we go. Engage in the bottom lane. Braum stepping forward. He's just going to have to stand aside. Now they're trying to re-engage. We'll miss the knockup. Okay, so not that much going No, this this bot lane is just skirmishing so much, but it's the entire time Kishuna is just coming out with the CS lead. He's sizably ahead in terms of a uh, farm compared to Enrique. And he is getting to that point. He is sitting on his tier, so he's just scaling up. He doesn't really want anything to happen down bot in terms of a... Uh, just scaling. He Ezreal scales really well into the mid game on those two item spikes, and when they do hit those two item spikes on the Ezreal, oh, they're going in. Yep, there's the Galio. He's gonna get stunned up, but he already finds the taunt onto the Brom. He's got the Unbreakable though, so that's a lot of damage going down. And avoid his spell shield by Silver will avoid the Glacier Fisher in the meantime. In the mid lane, there's the Scarner Gang. Gonna throw down the ultimate. The Poly Pop won't find Mr. Black Panda, but the Ignite will. Anime Lover takes a turret shot, but still the kill goes over to this Nico. Did a fantastic job game one. Seems to be starting off nice. 2 0 game number two. And good gank by Firefly to again tilt the matchup in the mid. Wherever this guy goes, he's getting really good picks up to assist his solo lane. Oh, they're going in again. Galio once again trying Ooh. to find the top. Will catch the Ezreal. He's lost a lot of health. The Unbreakable will fall from the Braum. The Santa side gives him a bit tanky stats so he gets out. 
but has to burn the flash as well. Two shot barrage drops right last low. Under 200 health, but no one here to try to pick up the kill. So Enrique and Rylas win the team fight in the bottom lane after so many times. Where they're kind of doing the run-in strat. They're like, if we taunt you enough times, we'll eventually get you to leave lane. They just force it there, and I'm very surprised that they were actually able to win the 2v2. Good play by Enrique and Rylas to get a lead in the lane where I thought they might be trying to forego it. Picking up double plating is really good because it gives, it gets Sivir to that. Oh, they're gonna go for a fight. Zest gonna immediately walk in as the team is coming back from the Fountain Firefly, dropping low. Skarner trying to scuttle away, but I think the crab will fall. It's on Urgot. Hold on, he gets a shield. Could anyone chase him down? Ooh. He's a fast shield. I really ult late. Galio ult comes in, knocks up Brom. No one here for the re engage. Rylas using the ultimate just Soon. to save his little crab friend None as an Enrique. Now, a little bit of the wall, seeing what he can do. Not gonna be able to do that much anime lover. Keep your eyes on him off to the side. Gonna try to throw out a bind on a Mr. Black Panda dropping that railing really low. About half health, but the fight is called off in a nice escape from Firefly. They're not able to pick up a Oh, they're going in mid. Oh, hold on, there's the Nico ultimate use. Pop Blossom to get a little bit of damage onto Mr. Black Panda. However, now has to escape the smite used by Zest just to kind of disengage the fight a little bit. Allow Aurelia to walk away for the moment. Hold on, Hextech wrote about the snare doesn't land though. Galio's still showing up. Looks like everyone's a little tentative to fight this game. They say we'll start a fight, but immediately back away because we're not ready to commit just yet as we are fairly even in gold. Almost a thousand lead for GMU. I was gonna say, by pushing Firefly off uh, and chunking him low, especially when the dragon would come, they could secure that second Cloud Dragon, but it, just a hero play by Anime Lover to get the CC down on Mr. Black, kind of push him off, and there it looks like George Mason's actually gonna be able to pick up the second Cloud Dragon, and they're gonna even up the Drakes one one apiece. So, speedy for both members. They don't have to worry about that being in effect. Oh, almost stole it away by the Brom Q. But Skunner does smite it and secure it. Windrake, Windrake will be even there. As Mr. Black Panda is still trying to deal with being down in farming mid lane, but he's catching up bit by bit. He's gonna get even, actually, on that 100 CS over, or uh, 100 CS over the Nico. Yeah, he's that farmed ahead. No, uh, 100 CS paired with the Nico. So good for him catching up in the top lane. Kenneth's still down a little bit, engaging the bottom lane. The Galio taunt gonna find the Brom, but he starts Glacial Fissure, and that means a ton of damage onto the Galio. He has the flash. Rallis is trying to get out. Mystic Shot drops him low. The flash forward from the Brom lands the Q, gets himself a kill, and now they want to chase onto Enrique. Okay, however, Five Five is around the corner. They can collapse upon the rest of the members of A and M. Mr. Black Panda looking potentially jump in onto this Zipper. Hits the blast cone. Zipper's out. In the top lane, Gracious is stopping the TP from the J4. Enrique flashing underneath. The turret has been spell shielded. Braun trying to get out. Doesn't go out fast enough. The turret shot will take him down. And now the Scar is trying to drag Sejuani into the turret. But Zess gets over the wall with the boar rush. However, the Ignite will take down. And Nico picks up the kill, leading in the end. I think for one for two for the side of GMU. And these team fights are so long from both teams. They do not hesitate to fight even when they are down a man. In terms of outplays, they're good job by Enrique to actually trade one for one against pretty much that four and five. And good response by Firefly and Anime Lover to assist him in that bot lane. They end up trading two for two, like you mentioned, and. This is good. We did mention that there was a massive lead for Kashuna in terms of just the laning phase gold. He was sitting at a 20-25-ish CS point uh, earlier on. By just getting Enrique any sort of gold injection and able to pick up some farm, they are able to scale out this Sivir comp more and more as the game goes. Big thing I want to know is how solid Eon is playing on this Jarvan pickup. He's getting a lot of damage that up there. He's able to put some power platings as well. And this Rage versus Melee match, which I thought would go so f in favor of Krocious on this cannon pickup, actually has been kind of jarred in favor, which I'm surprised to say. Yeah, up 20 CS can definitely be impactful as he's looking for a damage build focus, at least at the moment, as he's got that Hydra. So he will not only clear waste, but he also hurt when he jumps in. Many members of both teams around the bottom side. Once again, this seems to be the favorite place to scuttle. Scuffle? What is that word I'm looking for? Scuffle? Scuffle. It is scuffle. All right. One of those words you say, and you're just kind of like, hold on. Is that the right word am I using there? Scuffle towards the bottom side around the Drake. Drake's not up, though, so both sides will back away. But, man, these spires are being contested over again and again. Skarner really wants those. Gets that speed boost as well as that tactical boost. Look at the difference that it makes when clearing that control ward.
And in terms of Skarner, again, it's a pick that's been rising up in the 9.5 meta. That Spire range increase gives him a lot of ability to clear out a lot of these camps very quickly. He's able to move around the map very fast. And again, that Skarner attack is still such a big issue. You have to pay 1,300 gold to get QSS, or you're going to be hampered in the mid game because there's always a threat where Skarner catches you and he will pull you into his team. And you will die with the amount of damage that we see on the side of George Mason. Well, that's the reason why the Sejuani went down the last time the fight broke out. Could have had the chance to escape with a nice little rush, but still was taken down. Nice Skarner ultimate that used. Do want to check in on that Irelia build so far. It's finished the TM at and immediately goes back into a Sheen as well. From the Dino, she hasn't really completed any major items. For the Ezreal, though, he's got two items completed. Ice Spore Gauntlet and Man Immune. He's looking happy. He's looking strong. Let's see what Kushma can do with it. As this Rip Herald, hold on, goes down. And Scar picks it up, which means there might be a fight. As Sejuani throws down the ultimate. It's hitting up Anime Lover, sending the Nico for the moment. Irelia going to go back in. J4 drops the ultimate onto the Cannon, who stuns up. Gets dragged away by the ultimate from Scar. So we'll be the first victim, however, it's Skarner immediately to follow afterwards. Nice and on to Anime Lover. Galley's coming in, though, trying to reset the fight. This is Ronnie Tank it. She's alive. Panda goes down. Zest tries to get over the wall and gives. Just gets it. Rylas still on the chase. Hits the blast gun. I don't think he's going to find the range of the winds of war. But the Juani should be able to escape. But man, close stuff. And a two for one fight. No, two for two fight around Rip here. And again, these teams always just trade two for two. They're so... They're always so ready to go for these team fights, and just a great, great play by both Firefly Anime Lover to get into that team fight. They are able to pick up the Rift Herald I for Firefly there, so it is going to be a tower in the future if they can set it up properly on the side of George Mason. In terms of the dragon, the dragon is going to be spawning in the next five seconds. It's going to be an ocean dragon, so it is something that they might want to play around, especially with how these games are going they are going into the late game to that 35 minute point and elder dragon is always a win condition when you are picking team fight comps like this when you're picking a ball comp having any sort of advantage especially the true damage burn can be a huge boom for your team to get you the team fight one Alright, GMU collecting here around the Ocean Drake. They're dropping it low. Zest has the Blast Cone available to hop at the wall. Attempt for a steal. Mr. Black Pant is here as well. Looking like it's going to be a team fight. The Holy Slurp steps in to three members. Sejuani so steals away the Ocean Drake. And now the fight starts. Nico Ultimate's going to completely miss. No one there to be knocked out. Rylas has to run. And members of GMU get out alive, but they lose the Ocean Drake. Zest with a great steal. He was also the one who stole the Baron with the Jarvan in the last game. So, man, he is on point with these smites. And what an awkward team Ocean Dragon fight by both teams there. The Holy Slurp just kind of walked up and kind of baited the entire team on the side of George Mason. They had pulled off and during that time again Z3SS comes into the pit. He's our signature. He stole the Baron in game number one, was able to stall out first in game number two. He's able to steal that Ocean Dragon. Cannot go for these 50-50s with this guy on the map. And again, Getting that Ocean Dragon lead for the side of Texas A&M will contribute to that uh, if Elder Dragon play as the game does go on. In terms of how this game is scaling through, Jarvan right now is hitting that... He's hit the Titanic Hydra point and he is going towards that Black Cleaver. So in these teamfights, he's going to be outputting a lot of damage. He's going to be very tanky for his team. It's just, if they don't have proper setup like in that fight, we didn't see Yon uh, actually roam down quick enough, so they're not able to catch anything with that Nico ult. He, Nico really needs somebody to help him get good pop losses off of these teams. Absolutely right. Now for that Ezreal, he's about 30 CS, pushing 40 CS over this Sivir, which is actually insane. The amount of gold that he has, which allows him to not only complete those first two items, but also, as you talked about, pay that quick silver attack. So he's the first one to decide to Texas A and M that has been able to complete that for his team, which will be very nice because you know that Firefly after that last game, knowing how good Krishna is on this Ezreal, is going to be focusing him, targeting him. Let's get some flash. Spikes, what is that? Impale, that's right. Flash Impale down and on that Ezreal. So USS definitely needed it there. Both teams taking a bit of a breather when it comes to the team fighting, positioning, trying to fight for vision. Once again, DMU, fantastic job getting some of this deeper vision down. You can see this lonely ward over here on the top side for Texas A&M. 
It's a blue ward. Somebody needs to walk through that. Rift Herald dropped in the bottom lane as it was probably about to time out. So it will wander its way down there to join J4 in a push. And the Nico pick on the map is so weird to see. I always, I was looking at the map and I was like, why are there two Sivers on the map? What is going on here? But the, the Nico pick is Small indie company around. graphics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I faking passes out. Well, to be fair, the very first time Nico was ever played in a game, I knew that Nico was in the game. I commented that Nico was in the game. I mentioned that he's going to be causing a little bit of issues. I saw the uh, glow around the character, and I still went, huh? Like, the very first thing I did in the game was go, wait, what? And then I was like, oh, hold on, that's right, that's Nico. So, casters, they have their issues. This kind of comes in the mid lane. J4 was able to secure the turret on the bottom side, which is the second turret for GMU. Taking a small lead of those neutral objectives. Slightly less neutral, I guess. As a holy slurp, seeing if he can make something happen. Not finding anyone with his Q, though. One thing that is awkward for the side of George Mason as this mid game does go along is that they don't really have anybody to put into the side lane against the Aurelia. Nico was able to bully her out, especially in the early game. We saw her get that solo kill off. But as Aurelia has now picked up the Triforce sitting on the TM mat, Nico really can't sit against the Aurelia in the side lane, so they kind of have to send Sivir up there, which is a big issue because if Tex a and group around that mid lane, Sivir is needed to get uh, to have that wave there to make sure that this mid lane outer tower doesn't fall. Uh, in terms of just trading, it looks like both teams are going to just trade mid lane outer for top lane out. Oh my god! Top lane mid, hold on, Nico going in, looking for the play, only finds the damage onto the Sejuani, but J4 with the Cataclysm onto Kush, not going to deal massive Whoa. damage, but Ezreal gets the shield, he's still alive! Holy Slip takes down J4, Ezreal lives, throws out the true shot barrage, catching anime lover from this side of the flash forward from the Sivir, gets the damage down onto, I really can't find the boomerang, so take out the Ezreal, so it's a one for one at the moment for members of GMU, though. Find success in the mid lane. Let's see if they try to make a rotation anywhere. But yeah, crazy, crazy play. And J4 just couldn't drop this Ezreal. I could not believe Krishna actually lived in that team fight. They were just. His health bar dropped to pretty much single digits there. But again, the Guardian Shield from Braum. Braum able to keep Krishna alive. And again, in these team fights, if he's, going, he's, he's able to do that as uh, these team fights go along, that's going to be a big boon for the side of Texas AM. One thing to note, however, is that uh, Krishna this game did end up going for the iPhone Gauntlet instead of the Triforce. He is going to help him uh, make sure that the fire Fireflies can't really run into his team. He has a lot of slowdown, a lot of setup for his team. Hold so on, fight. here comes the Nico. She's got the ultimate once again. Pop Blossom could be used. Sejuani pulls off the ocean, breaks the fight, breaks out. Sejuani being a tank, get Galio in the front lines. J4 finds the knockup onto the Sejuani. So G's going to fall as the sides of A and M without that Aurelia are going to lose the Ocean Drake and lose one member. A little bit too over eager by the side of Texas A&M. They did not have Aurelia grouped up there. Mr. Black Tana didn't take teleport in this game and he's not able to group up there. Try to go for the 4v5, end up losing and giving over the Ocean Dragon. And these teams are so close. They're very sitting on Cloud and Ocean Dragon, both. And they're just separated by one big gold lead inside of Baybird uh, for George Mason. Krishna once again living through what could have been a bad fight beside a and but they only lose one, they lose the jungler, and again, the drakes are tied up between the two, so not quite as crazy as you might think, but that does mean for us as casters, this game is pretty crazy, still tied up almost even in gold at the 24 minute mark, which ladies and gentlemen is why both of these teams are in these playoffs, the best of five playoffs, they're looking to go all the way. And this is where things can get started. a and already happy with their one win. They would really love to secure themselves a second. Make things a lot easier for themselves. But GMU not willing to just roll over and let the game be a loss. They continue to fight for it. They've been good picking up all exterior turrets on the enemy team. J4 using the Cataclysm on the Creations from the bottom lane. Does he have the damage though? There goes the Slicing Maelstrom from the cannon. Can't find the stun. I am able to walk away. But still, good trade in the bottom lane. Good play by Ion there. He, oh, they're going to stage mid. Oh, not so much. Try to force it with the Sigur ulti and the uh, Starner Predator. Not able to get too much there. There is a window where uh, Ion's Garvin ulti will be up while Krishus' uh, Cannon ulti will not be. So they might be able to force that. That is a really tight window. So. Most likely not too much going to come out of it, but again, Ion is so tanky. He can force fights on Crocious. 
pretty much any time you want here. And uh, if he does get assist, maybe with the Galio roaming down or with Firefly uh, trailing him in the side lanes, that could be a way for George Mason Juliet to open up this match with the Starving Slipper. So, as they dance for Baron has begun, GMU, all five members here, they've got some pretty good vision down. You can see how many wards they're investing to make sure that even if a couple are cleaned out, they can still see where A and M are moving to. But A and M doing a better job. Look at how many control wards they've invested in their own jungle on the top side, making sure that they have at least one line of vision through the jungle to know where the enemy team is moving to. Rom maybe wanting to start things up, so Drani jumps forward. They can't find the CC, though. That mid lane turret down to about half. The GMU continue to defend, and this Sivir wave clear. It's going to be harder and harder to deal with. There goes J4, hopping over the wall, but Kusha immediately jumps out. Nice arcane shift to disengage the fight, but now the Sivir ultimate has been burned. GMU kind of wasted that a little bit. Once again, dancing around this Baron. And now that the Jarvan ulti is down, Krocious does have his cannon ultimate again. The amount of vision control that George Mason do have around the fans. Oh! There's the Scar ultimate, yeah, but a Scar nice cleanse from Mr. Black Hand. He gets himself out. Quick note, J4 has recalled, and the side lanes are pushing in favor of A and M. So whether it was accidental or purposeful, we're gonna call it 200 IQ. They got those side lanes pushing, and now with people having to back, with people having to recall, with people having to go and clear those side lanes, that means the A and M get advantage for around the barrel. Vision pretty much flips from the side of George Mason to the a and m and now George Mason wins. Oh! Oh, Kusha gonna be in trouble, gets hit! Galio Ultimate's gonna come and knock up two members of Bronze Raid, taking the Slicey Melter to the back line! Gracious is destroying everyone, takes down two, Gold's Gold as well, the stun onto the Galio, Rylas has to run, he's gonna fall, Firefly trying to step forward, doing what too he deep, can, that's deep. been able to secure two members of Texas a and m but they're underneath the turret, Zest is going to fall to the turret damage, and now the Holy Slurp has to run as, way, as well, and where A and M looked like they had won the game, or at least won the fight, GMU makes them pay for it. And again, that's the problem with these teams. They just step a little bit too far every time. What a fantastic cannon ultimate by Crocious to pretty much just insta-kill that backline of the Nico and Sivir. And you looked at it and you were like, oh my god, Texas A&M has a size. Oh, there's oh, Holy Sharp probably going to fall here. Ezreal jumps forward, trying to keep it defend. Nice unbreakable to avoid some of the damage coming out. True Shop Raj going to slice through. Will it pick up J4? Good sidestep. So he avoids death there. Anyway, continue before they rudely interrupted you. <laughs> Again, Crocious gets such a fantastic penalty. He had the Spellbinder Orb actually stacked up to 100, so he gets... Pretty much the canon dream in these team fights. Uh, we are going to be going into a pause, but I will continue my point here. Kennen ulti into the backline gets pretty much wipes out the backline, but Tex AM takes that step too far. They keep walking with the Ken, they keep walking with Mr. Black Pen on the Aurelia. They dive under tower, and Eon and Firefly are actually able to turn it around, pick up two kills, and then end up picking up Z3SS. And in terms of the trade, it just becomes an even three for three. The big problem being that. Sivir is still scaling. We always talk about it in almost every cast that I have with the Sivir when she does hit that three item power spike, that four item power spike, that 100% crit chance point where she becomes such a monster in these team fights. If she is, doesn't get one shot at Crocious in these team fights with the slicing Maelstrom, she's going to rip apart anybody on the side of Texas AM. And she's hit that three item spike. She now has the IE plus the Essence Shiver plus the attack speed item. And it's a big issue for the side of Texas a and Kishuna is having a fantastic game on the Ezreal, but there's nothing you can compare to to an Ezreal, to a Sivir sitting on three items. Once again, we're in the 5v5. Smash every button. Smash your entire team into their entire team and see who comes out in the lead. Kennen wanting all five members of GMU to be grouped up. But Sivir, the same thing. So you can see from both sides, they're kind of targeting each other in the same way. And in that case, the sixth man of the turret really helped out GMU to win, well, tie up at least, what looked to be, a, could have been a pretty bad fight. As we are sitting on this pause, I believe it was someone from the side of GMU said that they were having a bit of a lag issue, so we'll see if that uh, gets cleared up. Did want to mention quickly that, uh, obviously they interrupted you when you were doing some analysis of the last team fight, so they graciously said, you know what, we'll pause, and that way Prince can give as much analysis of the team fight as he wants before re re resuming the game. 
They have to make sure that I get my beautiful voice across here to make sure that they know why some of these team fights are going so evenly 28 <gasps> minutes into the game. Is that the 300 IQ? They say, hold up, we lost that team fight. We're going to pause. We're going to sit for five minutes, wait for the stream to catch up, listen to the caster's analysis of the team fight, and then restart the game knowing what we need to do now. Is that what's happening here? Genius. The 300 IQ play by Texas a and they're like, we don't know what to do in the mid game. Should we dive under the enemy team's tower? Let's see what the casters have to say. <laughs> if only no. the LCS don't... could do that. <laughs> My answer is no. Oh, see, we are got... getting back in the game. As Look at that, the answer, the answer came out and they said, resume. They yep. said, we, we don't dive under towers? Okay, got it. Got cool. it, We're, we've written it down in our notebooks. Put those notepads on our computer monitors. We know not to dive under the turret after winning a fight. So we will resume the game. It's going to be another win. Drake up and available for the picking. Not nearly as exciting, but as you said, something to keep in mind for those Elder Drakes. The Baron is still alive. And whoa, Texas a and immediately jump on it. They say, you know what? We're in position. We got the vision. Let's go down. They actually allow GMU to have a touch of vision once they put down that blue ward. This is they are burning scary. the power. The Baron down under 800. The fight, those Deagle flashes in. Gets the over oh. the five members. They are taking everything. Aurelia is still alive with full health, but I don't I don't think she's going to be able to turn this one around. She's going to fall, and Silver does it. Kushna trying to run away. Iona looking for just to push the Braum and the Ezreal Oak off as they are once again the only two members from A&M that live. I don't think they can steal away the Baron. The Nico did fall, having died so, so deep and winning the fight for A&M at the moment. Ezreal and Braum can do a little loop the loop see if they can make something happen over the wall. Getting nice poke down onto Iona. He's on the backside of the Baron, so he's taking max damage. Doesn't get stumped up, though, with the custom blows. The Firefly still going to continue to burn the Baron down under 200 under nope Helen Galio gonna try to push off the Ezreal threatening with the smite Baron goes down Skarner secures it and GMU win the fight and the Baron a really solid secure by George Mason they're not playing too over aggressive so pick up the Baron on four members and again in every one of these teams I have to say how is Anime Lover getting into such great situations with this Pop Blossom? He doesn't even really have help on the side of Eon and Galio that we didn't really see the Charlie Kelly ultimate come out. He just got such a fantastic four-man ultimate onto the backline. Oh, this is scary. Uh, yeah, Ezreal? Okay, there you go. Thinking twice about that. Comes back over the wall, so the Windrake should be able to be secured by GMU, but... As you were. Uh, again... Anime Lover on this Nico is, right now is my MVP for game number two. He's getting fantastic flanks onto the back line of Texas A&M with the amount of damage he's able to land off there. Again, Nico also has such a ridiculous 1.3 AP ratio. He gets so much damage off, able to blast down Crocious before the team fight even started. And without that cannon threat for the back line of George Mason, there's not really too much threat. The Aureli is so far behind and Again, we talk about the Skarner attack. Look at how much of a big issue it is for the Aurelia. She's already set far behind due to her uh, poor laning against the Nico, and having to pick up that QF is not being able to pick up her second item at all. Ooh, they're going in. Yeah, Wani stepping forward, maybe just trying to push GNM off of the inhibitor turret. This is the problem with them last game. They lost an inhibitor due to a split push, and things kind of slowly started to fall apart from there. Even though they won a team fight and had a small chance to get back into the game, they're going to see if they can maybe catch the J4, however, Ion hits the blast cone, goes over the wall, gets out. Once again, the siege continues in the bottom lane. I'm really curious to see if Nico Van comes through from game number three, because both games, and my lover has been quite an annoyance on that champion. George Mason has about a minute to keep pushing with this Baron, so they're just going to be trying to push in as many sideways as possible. The problem just being that Sivir isn't able to really safely hit these towers without the fear of either the Braum or the Swan trying to engage and force it onto her. If she does go down in the end of the fight, it's really hard for Joy to make win. She is pretty much that consistent answer. And then coming in. Be able to secure the inhibitor. Hold on, Kenan, looking for the back line, but he's immediately pushed away. The stun, though, onto the Galio. He's going to fall. There's no way that he's getting out of that one, and somehow the turret is still alive just with a breath of life as the Ezreal two shot barrage is going to just touch the J4 on his way out. The Baron recalls are through. They lose. They don't get the turret, and they lose one, so they back away. Nicely done from AM on the turtling and defensiveness. Yep, very good by Texas AM to not really concede that falling inhibitor and. It doesn't feel like George Mason is actually going to be pick up anything from this Baron 
power play, they were able to get the mid lane inner tower, but besides that, not able to crack the base. And this game is going to get to that point where now Baron is going to be a threat, and so is the Elder Dragon. And with both teams having two to three Elder uh, Dragon stacks apiece, both of these objectives are going to be really important, and we're going to have to see how these teams play the macro in the late game. Well, and I really have to uh, give credit to Kratos on that cannon when he's using the slicing maelstrom around the turret, considering going in onto all five members, trying to make the big play. He chose not to, and that's sometimes what you have to do. You take what you can get. They kill the Galio, but they don't lose anyone. And that's crucial because it means, once again, now that they have the numbers advantage, they can just defend the base. That means the GMU is going to back away. Hold on, Blasco and Pop forcing Io into the middle of the enemy team. We've got a 5v5 breaking out, though. Galio all going to land oh. on two member two shots barrage through a couple of them. The Nico ultimate once again gonna tear through the enemy lines and this Garner Impale gonna knock down Zest trying to get to the wall to rush over it but will not be able to do so and the Ezreal survives this time the Irelia as well but GMU continue to win these fights. You were talking about it again sometimes you just don't want to take the team fight they get a little bit over eager thinking that they can burst down Eon on this driver but he's so God damn kinky. And Anime Lover gets another fantastic pop one. How many times have we seen this Nico, even without any setup, no help from the Jarvan, no help from the Galio, get fantastic pop bosses up? And she's really turning these team fights for the side of George Mason. And I'll try to look a little bit more, but it's just pushing them off. Galio engaging. Well, yeah. Won't find the stun, the taunt. Oh, hold on. Ultimate use by that really. She's going to be diving in, getting a little bit of damage. J4 is here. He could try to collapse onto everyone. He doesn't have the ultimate, but that's not necessary. Scalio talk will do the work. And Enrique goes on a rampage, as you said. The Sivir getting fed. She's got a GA. She's now running away. Oh, and Kratos Look on the like, backside. Yeah. He's going to have to really flee himself. All right, he's out. Kratos tried to do a teleport flank, but... The side of George Mason is immediately turned on him and forcing him back. They're going to pick up the Botlin in Hipper 2. 2 and Hips is really that break point where we see the enemy team can't really come back from him with the amount of pressure that they put on them. And 40 seconds is going to be that Baron buff. Elder is also up in 20 seconds, so with them being stuck in their base against the Siege of Super Minions, this is do or die for the side of Texas AM. They either need to fight for one of these objectives and hopefully get a good team fight. We have seen them get really good cannon flanks, really good slicing maelstrom. If they can get into that back line, they can annihilate the fight. But if they can't, I would say Jordan is going to play it slowly. They need to wait for Superman Waves to push into the, in, into the base of Texas AM. And as long as they just wait, they don't really have to force any fights. Well, they might be forced in now as the Elder Drake is started up. Will they oh, knock away from no. them? Can they catch out Firefly? Nice up break from Brom keeps everyone else out of the fight. The Nico Ultimate going to land on one because get it into the back line. Slicing Mills from one of four members that he gets dropped as the Nico will pop him with that pop blossom. And now the Holy Slurp going to fall. Zest, the only one left alive, should be falling as well. And GMU wipes the floor with Texas A&M. They say you're desperately trying to get an Elder Drake. Why don't we crush you and even have, what was that, J4 TP into the enemy team base, they want to finish the game off. And if Anime Lover is the consistent player of George Mason, then Eon is the clutch player for them. He gets another fantastic EQ. The fact that the Jarvan was able to get the EQ on Kashuna on the Ezreal, he able to dunk him down, put him so low before the team fight even started. Again, we see Eon. He makes the play that ends up winning George Mason the game. He's able to catch up Kashuna again on this Ezreal pickup. And it's just another game where George Mason gets the advantage, throws it a little bit due to a, some poor macro and some poor team that and overstepping that both teams have done. But when it comes to the end, when it comes to making those clutch plays that do end up winning the game for your team or end up losing it for it, they come up clutch. Yeah, just absolutely beautiful stuff. We've talked about it already. Anime just really crushing on this Nico with those ultimates. Definitely something to consider on the side of A&M banning away. Did want to give credit to Kratos, even though he didn't have quite the effect that he wanted to. His positioning was solid, and it did give A&M a bit of the early edge. However, those later game 5v5 team fights, you just can't deal with Nico's invulnerable AOE, CC, and burst damage. I mean, that's the reason why people don't like Nico. She's just going to win those 5v5s. 
she's just so flexible for the side of anime lover. He he's able to get advantages in the lane. He's able to he got he got the solo kill like level three. He one lane and then he's able to transition into his team fight so well. Gets such good ultimate off. And I mentioned this and I keep harping on it, beating on a dead horse. But he's not getting help in these engages. He's finding these flanks into the into the backline, getting three four man Nico ultimates by himself, and he's just playing so well for the side of George Mason in game number two and game number four. All right, well, a successful second win for GMU. They've done a fantastic job so far. Maybe they make it a quick 3-0. Who knows? We'll find out. Don't go anywhere. We really got to see what AMM can do to come back in this. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go anywhere.